this spring. Only one hero can save her family and prevent disaster. Mom, we're gonna be late for school. I don't think so. Whoa. Experience the phenomenon that critics are calling inspiring. Mom, I can't find number 17. Come on, Billy, dig deep. A lot of fun. And pure genius. Mom, where's my phone? Table. Keys. Mudroom. Dragon Man. Under the couch between the monkey and the flip-flop. How does she do that? Created by God to demonstrate his love with grace, elegance, and poise. Butane torch? Good morning. 
Welcome to worship this morning and happy Mother's Day to all of you who are celebrating this. I'll turn your attention to the messenger and uh, a couple things. I'm going to let you do your announcement first. So I'll grab this for you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Colleen Prosser, and I just wanted to give everybody an update on the Safe to Sleep Transition House. Uh, the renters have moved out about a week and a half ago, and we've started the repairs. If there's anybody that's interested in looking at the house, it's open today. I opened it up this morning. It'll be open until about 1 o'clock this afternoon. Go over, take a look. It's a great house. It'll, it'll be a great project for the whole church to help these women. And if you have any talent and would like to help out, we sure could use some people to help repair things. There's lists of what needs to be done over there. If you want to jot your name down next to one, we'd appreciate it. Thanks. Other announcements from community? I have one. Okay. Sneaking out. Um, tomorrow evening at 5 o'clock, um, it is listed as 5 to 6 o'clock. Meeting over here is a planning meeting for VBS. VBS is yes. middle end of June. I think it's in there. It's the 17th, I feel like. Mm -hmm. but, um, I we're going to plan it. We need more volunteers, youth volunteers and adult volunteers as well to track down all these kiddos and get them pointing in the right direction. Thanks. Yep, so that's 5 o'clock tomorrow. Yes. And then also um, next week, the 20th, during 11 o'clock worship, we'll have confirmation service, so we'll be celebrating our confirmants. The week after that, we begin our summer Sunday schedule, so Saturday nights will continue being 5.30, no change there, but Sunday mornings, we'll have one service at 9.30 on odd Sundays, so first Sunday, third, third Sunday, and fifth Sunday will be the classic style, which is what you'd be familiar with at the 8.30 service. And then second and fourth Sunday will be the uh, blended style of worship, which is what we have here at 11 o'clock. Um, the 27th is the only exception. It's a fourth Sunday, but we're doing the classic style on that Sunday. So, um, so classic is the 8.30 style of worship, and blended is the 11 o'clock style of worship, classic is first, third, fifth Sunday, blended is second and fourth Sunday. I invite you to please come to all those worship services, um, but for the summer we'll be trying this one worship service time um, and bringing everyone together for one worship in the summer. So we'll see how that works and, and trying it out, you know, we haven't done this, so be something new. Um, that is probably our biggest announcement for what's coming up. The rest you can pick up in the bulletin here. So uh, this morning we are going to be having the anniversary of baptism as well. So let us begin with our opening song and then we'll continue with the anniversary of baptism. Please stand. <laughs>
I invite all those that are uh, celebrating the anniversary of their baptism to come forward and kind of gather around here. up on the screens, cross your fingers, it all works. When you claimed these beloved young people in holy baptism, we made sacred promises. Parents promised, and parents, you read your part. Sponsors or godparents in this congregation promised to nurture them in Christian faith and to support them and pray for them in their new life in Christ. And today we re keep and renew these promises. So I invite parents, um, you may dip a, a hand, finger in the baptismal font and then uh, you'll make the sign of the cross on your child's body during the following litany. Okay. That you may hear the good news of Christ, the word of life, receive the sign of the cross on your ears. That you may see the light of Christ illuminating your way. Receive the sign of the cross on your eyes. That you may sing the praise of Christ, the joy of the church. Receive the sign of the cross on your lips. That you may dwell with that God may dwell within you by faith, receive the sign of the cross on your heart. That you may bear the gentle yoke of Christ in serving, receive the sign of the cross on your shoulders. That God's mercy may be known in your works, receive the sign of the cross on your hands. that you may follow the way of Christ. Receive the sign of the cross on your feet. Now, if you brought your um, baptismal candle, if not, we have some extra candles up here. I invite you to light the candle from the uh, Christ candle. When you were baptized, these light candles were lit and 
these words were said, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will have the light of life. And that we are to go and let our lights shine. And these candles are a reminder of that. And I invite the whole congregation to stand at this time as we confess our beliefs in answer to these questions. Do you believe in God the Father? I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Do you believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God? I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. Do you believe in God, the Holy Spirit? Ah, we're waiting for the slide. How many remember it from confirmation? <laughs> oh, we're having an issue here. We'll start. Uh, we'll, we'll do a test of your memory. Do you believe in God, the Holy Spirit? I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Good job. Pre-test for any confirmants here. <laughs> Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for the new life you give us through holy baptism. Especially, we ask you to bless each of these young people on the anniversary of their baptism. Continue to strengthen them with the Holy Spirit and increase in them your gifts of grace, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord, the spirit of joy in your presence. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, we pray. Amen. Receive this blessing. Gracious and glorious God, you have chosen us as your own, and by the powerful name of Jesus, you protect us from evil. By your spirit, transform us in your beloved world, that we may find our joy in your Son, Jesus Christ, who is our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you. You can blow out your candles.
I have two readings this morning. The message is taken from our first lesson, which is from the book of Acts. Acts 1, 15 through 17, 21 through 26. In those days, Peter stood up among the believers. Together, the crowd numbered about 120 persons and said, Friends, the scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit through David foretold concerning Judas, who became a guide for those who arrested Jesus. For he was numbered among us and was allotted his share in this ministry. So one of the men who, who have accompanied us during all of the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John until the day in which he was taken up from us, one of these must become a witness with us to the resurrection. So they proposed two, Joseph called Barsabbas, who is also known as Justice, and Matthias. Then they prayed and said, Lord, you know everyone's heart. Show us which one of these two you have chosen to take the place in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas turned aside to go to his own place. And they cast lots for them, and the lot fell on Matthias, and he was added to the eleven apostles. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now I invite you to please stand and hear the gospel. It's according to St. John, the 17th chapter. Jesus prayed, I have made your name known to those whom you gave me from the world. They were yours, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything you have given me is from you. For the words that you gave to me, I have given to them, and they have received them, and know in truth that I came from you, and they have believed that you sent me. I am asking on their behalf, I am not asking on the behalf of the world, but on behalf of those whom you gave me, because they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I have been glorified in them. And now I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them in your name that you have given me, so that they may be one as we are one. While I was with them, I protected them in your name that you have given me. I guarded them. And not one of them was lost except the one destined to be lost, so that the scripture might be fulfilled. But now I am coming to you, and I speak these things in the world, so that they may have my joy made complete in them. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they do not belong to the world, just as I do not belong to the world. I am not asking you to take them out of the world, but I ask you to protect them from the evil one. They do not belong to the world as I, just as I do not belong to the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you have sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself, so that they also may be sanctified in truth. Gospel of the Lord. Grace and peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Take this time to share the peace with one another. So invite the kids to come forward. We'll have a children's message. Good morning. Can you come on up? Well, this morning I'm going to say some things that are in kind of an order and um, you'll hear them and finish the order of what I'm saying. I think you'll get it when I start, okay? So one, two, 
three, what's next? Four, right, okay, here's another one. A, B, C, D, E, all right, here's another one. Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Sunday, okay. There's a fancy word for what that is when things have a certain order that you, you know what comes after it. It's called a sequence, okay? So that's the word when um, the next thing that uh, you, you say one thing and the next thing is in order and you, and you know what that sequence is. And there's lots and lots of sequences in the world. Um, in the scripture we heard today, Jesus prayed in a sequence, okay, in a certain order. And, and the order goes like this. First step was God gives words to Jesus, and the second was Jesus gives those words to his disciples, and the third was the disciples gave that word to everyone else. And the disciples did a pretty good job of that uh, third step because it's like 2,000 years later and we're still talking about it. So the disciples told their disciples who told their disciples who told other people who told other people who told other people and eventually your parents heard it and then they told you and the community here at Messiah are other people that are telling you this story as well. And so you, this is how Jesus' prayer went. And so it went, God to Jesus, to the disciples, to, yeah, to us, yeah, to me, to you, to us, right? Okay, so that is the cool good news is that um, we can tell those stories then to someone else, and we're just part of that whole prayer that Jesus had. So um, that's how we know about Jesus is because we tell each other about him. And he prayed that way, 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 way back then about this story to God, to Jesus, to disciples, to everyone else. Let's pray a prayer of um, repeat after me prayer, okay? Dear God, thank you for Jesus who received your words and shared them with the disciples who shared them with other disciples until we received them. Help us to share your words too. Amen. Thanks. You can have a seat. So as I shared, the text this morning that I'm uh, going to share a message on is the Acts 1 text. Uh, basically, what happened with those disciples, right? Um, so they get the message God gave to Jesus. Jesus shares this story, a life-changing story and message with them, and then they are sitting in a room waiting. And that's where our story starts. In fact, it, it starts a little before that, a little background. Judas was one of the 12 disciples who betrays Jesus and is now dead. Jesus rises from the grave and goes and stays with the disciples, all the disciples, not just the 12, men and women, a whole big, large group, and uh, stays with them for 40 days, sharing uh, convincing proofs that he is alive, that he is real, and that uh, death could not hold him. And then at the end of that 40 days, Luke tells us that he ascended to heaven. The celebration of ascension was on the 10th this year, so that would have been um, this last week. And Jesus is lifted up in the heavens and assures the disciples that you will receive the power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses to the ends of the earth. And so ten days later, the Holy Spirit comes upon them on the day of Pentecost, which means 50 days. And, uh, and the day of Pentecost, when um, 
the Holy Spirit comes upon them, which is next Sunday, the 20th, um, this year. It's not an actual date when it is, it's more of the timing thing. The earliest followers of the way, which is what Christians were known because the word Christian didn't exist then, um, they were just called the followers of the way. They were um, gathering in a large upper room in Jerusalem doing what Jesus told them to do. Stay and wait. Go back to Jerusalem, stay together, and wait. And staying and waiting, I mean, they were waiting for something worthwhile. God was going to send them the Holy Spirit. That's pretty amazing thing to wait for. But we know we're humans. We don't like to wait. We like to know, and we really don't like times of transition and not knowing and having to just wait. So they're starting to feel a little frustrated, and that intensifies irritations with each other. And then on top of all that, Jesus had, had strained their hopes because they had all these hopes set upon him in his resurrection from the dead to inaugurate some great kingdom, some great revolution in Israel. And Jesus basically tells them when they ask, well, when is, when is the kingdom of Israel going to um, rise? And, and Jesus says, um, it's not for you to know the time when the coming kingdom of God will be. So there are these ethnic hopes that they had uh, hung on Jesus that were then dashed with the cross and now were lifted up again with his resurrection and then his ascension just left them in this place of not yet. Kind of, huh, here we are. So they were in, you would call this a marker of crisis, um, things had not turned out the way that they had wanted them to or expected them to and hoped. So you've got them waiting, unknowns, kind of irritated, dashed hopes, or at least sitting there with no clear answer. And then on top of it all, they have a transition of leadership. So one of the 12 had John gone dramatically astray. He had betrayed the community. And any time you have an experience in an organization or a, a community or a family or in which one person betrays the family, the community, the organization, there are these um, issues that come up in the aftermath. People experience anger and grief and confusion and loss and they, they lose confidence in their judgment and they may have enduring suspicion of other people's reliability. So this is a community in transition. They are uh, dealing with some, some heavy emotions. So it's not surprising that Peter, being a, a go-to action type of personality, would remind them that, you know, we, we've got this gap to fill, this gap in leadership. That's something we can do while we're waiting. Let's, let's do some church business. Let's take care of things. And so candidates, uh, the, a selection process was designed and uh, qualifications were set. So the candidates would uh, need to have been followers of Jesus since the beginning of his ministry. So since John's baptism was determined, the beginning of the ministry, into his ascension. So amid the 120 people gathered there, two candidates were chosen. Verse 23 almost sets you up to expect that Joseph, called Barsabbas, called Justice, and not Matthias, would be chosen because he seems to be better known or chummier. I mean, he has all these nicknames. 
And the 11 disciples were known for having a lot of nicknames. Um, they were pretty chummy folks. So you almost feel like he's the in guy. Nonetheless, they're both qualified. They're passionate about God's purpose for their lives, about sharing this life-changing story that they've experienced and lived through since the beginning. And so with prayers that God's will be done, that the great heart knower would select the one who would replace Judas, you have Justice and Matthias's names etched on stone, put in a container, and shaken until one of them falls out. And the lot fell on Matthias. But not much is known about Matthias. We, there is speculation. He may have been a missionary to Ethiopia. Uh, he may have been a witness in Jerusalem. A quiet one, because we, we never hear another word about Matthias. Nor do we ever hear another word about justice. We know he'd been there from the beginning, that he had a lot of nicknames. He was probably a pretty likable fellow. Anyone with his passion and devotion would have longed to have been part of the inner circle, I'm sure. And when the lot was cast against him, that had to be rough. I mean, imagine going through life knowing as the one God didn't choose. Have you ever done the work but not gotten the reward you think you deserved? Or just some randomness that costs you, like your company lays off five people and you're one of the five and there really isn't any reason, there isn't any fault or anything like that, it just somebody had to go. Or you interview for a job and you make it up to the top two and you're not the one chosen. And after all that preparation and your high hopes and, and you're counting on this and you work so hard and then you, you don't get it and there's this disappointment that's just heartbreaking at the time. And I think that Justice probably had a response of disappointment like that because, you know, look at his name, Justice. Just us. He's just like us. All of us. When we thought we've been on the right path or, or truly doing what needs to be done and, and, and uh, setting goals that are the goals we need to set and then everything changes and the direction changes and, and you're left there wondering, well, what's up with that? I mean, it seems so certain. And then it wasn't. Justice could have felt, dis well, he definitely felt disappointment, but he could have felt hurt, he could have felt cynical, he could have become cynical or critical. Um, he could have let his pride hold him back from living out his passion to witness and minister. But... We never hear another word about justice. And Luke liked to write about the disciples' flaws. And so, because I, there is no mention of justice, I think he probably did the right thing. I think he didn't behave badly. I think that he probably just gave Matthias a big hug and said, I'll support you in every way, brother. Maybe he was a partner with him in evangelism. Who knows? I think Justice knew that he was uh, who he was and what God wanted him to do, or placed in his heart to do, at least. And that was with or without a title, that Justice would go on sharing this witness of a life-changing story he'd experienced in Jesus thought about that idea of like knowing your heart's desire, um, making decisions to act upon your heart's desire. When I happened to watch American Idol this last week, they did the whole thing on Prince, and I love Prince, I'm from Minnesota, you know, gotta 
got to get my prints fixed. And uh, so they, I was watching, I was thinking about how in, in these talent shows and like Idol and, and, and many of the others, you'll have that audition period in which you have all these people who have just these heartbreaking, uh, they have such great hopes, but maybe they don't have the talent to go with their desire. But as the season goes on and the selected competitors become smaller and smaller, you know towards the end that whether they get third place, fifth place, first place, it doesn't matter if they get the title or not. All of these people have a self-knowledge of who they are, which is a musician and an entertainer. And somehow they're going to live that out. Discerning our path in life is not always so clear. We use the best decision-making process that we know when we're trying to discern our life's path and why we are here and answer to those existential questions. But oftentimes it isn't until we're looking back in retrospect that we see where God's work was working through those matters when not getting that job was the best thing that could have happened for us even though it was so deeply disappointing and heartbreaking at the time. In Acts 1, 24, the disciples pray, You, Lord, who know the hearts of all. Cardionostis is the Greek word. It means heart knower. And they're praying that, that God is the great heart knower and will reveal God's will to their hearts. And we all want to know God's will for us. What's our purpose? Now, I, I, I really wanted to share some golden answer and, and you know, step-by-step -step plan and how to do that. But, God, the Bible just isn't that way. <laughs> it really doesn't give you those kind of answers. An insight I got on how do you discern God's will how do I know the heart knower is speaking to my heart? Um, was from Professor Richard Jensen. He gave three criteria uh, of knowing in his commentary on the story of Acts, this story of Acts. He said, first, we know that we are called to love God and to love our neighbor. And so when we're faced with a choice about our, our purpose or what's God's will, ask yourself, how is this loving God, and how is this loving my neighbor in, in that decision? How is this loving God, and how is this loving my neighbor? Second, we know that we live our lives under the canopy of God's forgiving love. So the thing is, is we can pray and pray for God's will to be revealed, preferably in specifics, and it may not be revealed, or it may not be revealed in the timing we want, or it may not be revealed in the specifics that we wish we could get. And so sometimes we kind of stumble along. We cast lots. We hope that we are living lives that please God. Martin Luther advised about this that we will have to choose boldly our path, that we just have to choose boldly our path. And we don't often know for certain which is the right path. We choose, knowing that God's forgiving love will sustain us in the midst of our lives' many decisions. The third point is that we know that nothing can separate us from the love of God and that our bad decisions cannot separate us from the love of God. That God is always working to make the best out of our decisions because of, we know this because of Jesus' mission statement. I come that they may have life and that they may have life everlasting. 
We have a God of life, a creator God. So the action and the power and the direction of God is always going to be for life. So when we make those decisions that maybe weren't life-giving, we can surrender them and pray for God to find a way to bring life out of them, to always bring us about to a life-giving uh, place. So we choose, we decide, we act. And even as I read the story in Acts, I discover that there is ongoing debate and argument as to whether the disciples made the right choice that they made in their decision-making process when they were seeking a 12th disciple to fill the gap. Some argue that the disciples chose Matthias and God chose Paul. So there's this ongoing argument of who really was the 12th apostle. Some say that uh, you know, Peter, always a, a, a person of quick action and, and um, and, and trying to, to get things done, that, you know, he used good reasoning. Uh, the scriptures spoke of the drama of Judas's actions, that they were part of a, a God's um, design, and a replacement must be needed. And, and Peter just thought, well, that must be something we need to do immediately. But prior to the arrival of the Holy Spirit, the community was very inward focused. They were circling their wagons. They were in this, as I explained earlier, in this kind of state of anxiety and, and uh, trial and high emotions. They were radically keeping to their own. But when the Spirit came upon them, they saw that Jesus had a much bigger vision than they had. That God was concerned with the restoration of all of creation and not just Israel. And that changed some things. So even though Matthias was chosen by the disciples through the casting of lots, maybe the Spirit elected Paul to carry out the apostolic mantle that Judas left vacant? We don't know. The criteria established by Peter, seconded by the apostolic consent of that group, namely to replace Judas, and that that replacement ought to be a witness of the entire ministry of Jesus from the beginning, it may not have been seconded by the Holy Spirit, who saw that there was a need for someone very different. And maybe that's why we never hear about Matthias, is because he was no Paul. The disciples did the best they could to discern God's will. And that's all we do and can do. We choose, we decide, we act, we trust. And the God of life works life-giving power through those decisions. Choosing boldly your path, knowing that God's forgiving love will sustain you in the midst of your messy lives and your many decisions. That's an assurance we do have. And whether Matthias was the chosen 12th or Paul, it doesn't really matter because they all shared that story and they shared it to the next generation and the next generation and here we are sharing it again and that is what matters for nothing can separate us from the love of God which is at work in the midst of all of our decisions amen
Please rise and sing as we share our tithes and offerings. Today are a Mother's Day litany. And they think we have a song first. <laughs> Sorry. on this day set aside to honor and remember mothers we give you thanks for our mothers we offer great we are grateful that you chose to give us life through them and that they received the gift of life from your hands and gave it to us thank you for the sacrifices they made in carrying us and giving us birth we thank you for the women who raised us who were our mothers in childhood, whether birth mom, adopted mom, older sister, aunt, grandmother, stepmother, or someone else. We thank you for those women who held us and fed us, who cared for us and kissed away our pain. We pray that our lives may reflect the love they showed us and that they would be pleased to be called our moms. We pray for older moms whose children are growing. Grant them joy and satisfaction for a job well done. We pray for new moms experiencing changes they could not predict. Grant them rest and peace as they trust you for the future. We pray for pregnant moms who will soon be moms. Grant them patience and good counsel in the coming months. We pray for moms who face the demands of single parenthood. Grant them strength and wisdom. We pray for moms who enjoy 
financial abundance. Grant them time to share with their families. We pray for moms who are raising their children in poverty. Grant them relief and justice. We pray for stepmoms. Grant them patience and understanding and love. We pray for moms who are separated from their children. Grant them faith and hope. We pray for moms in marriages that are in crisis. Grant them support and insight. We pray for moms who have lost children. Grant them comfort in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We pray for moms who gave up their children for adoption. Grant them peace and confidence as they trust in your providence. We pray for adoptive moms. Grant them joy and gratitude for the gift you have provided. We pray for girls and women who think about being moms. Grant them wisdom and discernment. We pray for all women who have assumed the mother's role in a child's life. Grant them joy and appreciation of others. We pray for those people present who are grieving the loss of their mother in the past year. Grant them comfort and hope in Christ's resurrection. Amen. Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, blessed it, broke it, and gave it to all to eat, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, blessed it, and gave it to all to drink, saying, Take and drink. This cup is the new covenant of my blood, shed for you and for all people, for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Whenever we eat of this bread and drink of this cup, we do so remembering Christ died, Christ risen, and Christ shall come again. And let us pray together as Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. All are welcome to receive this meal of forgiveness. We will commune by intinction. So you'll receive the bread, hold on to it, and then dip it in either the dark liquid or the light liquid. Uh, the dark is wine, the light is grape juice. We'll have gluten-free elements available on a little stand. It will be nearest me, so if you need that, you'll just um, pick up the, the gluten-free wafer and dip it in the wine that is next to it, and I will say the words over that when you do that. We'll have one station, it's a standing station, so just this side will come up first um, and receive, and then this side of the room will come up. Come let us eat.
invite you to stand and receive the blessing of communion. The body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you always in his grace. Amen. And receive the blessing. May Jesus, who was raised from the dead and gave us new life, gave us the promise of life everlasting, be with you and bring you joy. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs>